Dynamic reduction methods are needed in finite element analysis because the model that has been constructed often is too large and complex to efficiently solve for the vibration characteristics. For instance, an automobile might have a million or two million degrees of freedom, mostly caused by the need to model the geometry of the problem. Uh, not so much stiffness or mass distribution, but just to get all the angles and holes and corners and brackets and so on. Therefore, there's some need to simplify in a consistent way the scope of the problem so that a person can understand the lower modes of vibration of the system. Um, it's been my experience that in stress analysis in static problems, Often the interest of the designer, engineer, analyst is to find details around local portions of the structure. Where does it break? Where does it fatigue? And those are local ideas. In contrast, the, the dynamicist wants to get global behavior. What are the long wavelength frequencies that are involved? So it's interesting. Uh, it's almost a conflict in uh, function between the static stress analyst and then the dynamic analyst. Well, dynamic reduction methods are meant to bridge that gap. One of them is really straightforward and easy to discuss, and that's the so-called static condensation. Now, this is a nodal condensation as opposed to a mode condensation that we studied earlier under uh, the modal solution methods. So the concentration is how you handle the degrees of freedom at nodes in this case. Unfortunately, to move beyond static condensation gets tough very quickly. I find it more difficult to teach that material, and so I don't stress it as much. I view it as an advanced topic. When you get into component mode synthesis, generalized dynamic reduction. Some of those methods are really fairly uh, theoretically uh, involved. So um, what I'll do is pull my punches a little here and hit static condensation pretty hard and then uh, kind of wave my arms a little on the more complicated uh, reduction methods. Now, this is OK. I'm going to argue it's OK because some of the new solvers don't really need this simplification. For instance, the Lanchos method seems to work uh, for fairly large problems in a direct way. Um, and so I hope that the user can figure out in your own corporate setting of what sort of dynamic reduction method you're interested in. There are a lot of vehicle people that still really like component mode synthesis. And that's a super element type of uh, condensation approach. Well, the uh, procedure will be to talk in general about dynamic reduction. Uh, hit the static condensation rather hard on Guyan reduction and do some examples. And then I'll just wave my arms at generalized dynamic reduction and component mode synthesis. We'll follow with some uh, problem session examples, which are primarily the static reduction type up here. I'll start off with a bit of an overview of dynamic reduction. In dynamic analysis, the necessary steps are to assemble the equations, solve them, and then recover the forces and stresses that are the internal um, field variables in the problem. An optional step, though, which is so important, is this one where you might reduce the number of degrees of freedom in the system. Basically, you pass from a set of physical degrees of freedom to a set of coordinates that are more or less artificial. Sometimes that reduced set of uh, coordinates carries within it the uh, more complicated behavior of the whole system, but in some idealized way. If you don't do dynamic reduction, you'll find that the solution of the equations here really becomes the expensive part by far, uh, more than 90% in most cases. So you would be willing to do a certain amount of work at this stage in dynamic reduction in order to reduce the solution cost. There are several forms for dynamic reduction. 
we've already spoken about a modal approach using normal modes as our building blocks. Then the nodal condensations are such as the Guyan reduction here. Generalized dynamic reduction is a bit in between where you have somewhat of a global and somewhat of a local uh, view on the situation, and we'll show some of those equations later. Component mode synthesis is the dynamic version of uh, superelement theory where you uh, segment your larger structure into pieces. Then those pieces are joined after they're separately analyzed dynamically. And uh, one, one key question there is how do you join them together? Um, certainly if you use a modal solution alone for really large problems, you may get into troubles with the cost of eigenvalue extraction. And then as you get above uh, 10,000 degrees of freedom, you're really forced to go to something pretty powerful, perhaps component mode synthesis or these newer Lancho solvers. The Lancho solver has pretty well swept through the industry as I speak and is now the dominant large problem solver. Now let's discuss this Guyan reduction or static condensation and see how it works. We can follow it rather well. In fact, you should understand this method cold. I think it's useful because it also gives you the whole spirit of other condensation methods. We'll illustrate this with the MSC Nastran uh, data uh, definitions and their uh, sets of variables. The original set of physical variables would be called u sub g. And then after reducing out the multipoint constraints, you're left with a set u sub n. At that point, you apply the single point constraints, and you're left with these degrees of freedom, u sub f. Here's where condensation enters, and there are a certain number of degrees of freedom that are considered to be omitted degrees of freedom. When those are taken out, you're then left with the analysis set of degrees of freedom. Even the analysis set, which is what we will work with today, can be subdivided into those degrees of freedom that represent rigid body modes and those that are uh, or need to be constrained to re if you wish to remove them, and those that are the uh, final independent degrees of freedom, which are you can think of as the left de your leftover <laughs> degrees of freedom. But basically in dynamics, there's no need, as there is uh, in statics, however, uh, to remove rigid body modes. So it's better to work at this analysis set of uh, variable level here. So we will be looking at Guyan reduction in the way that you progress from this set of degrees of freedom here and how you break that into this set and this set. We won't go to the sm finest, smallest detail where you're worried about uh, degrees of freedom that characterize rigid body modes, since in dynamics they can be carried along anyway. Let's work out the mathematics for the Guyan reduction and um, We'll do it, as I would mentioned, in terms of those sets of variables subscripted with F. We might call those free degrees of freedom, just to, to coin a word to um, let us discuss what that is. And the A set will be the analysis set. So if we write the equations of motion at this stage, then the multipoint constraints have been reduced out of the system and the single point constraints have been reduced out. So these then are the free degrees of freedom that describe the uh, active degrees of freedom that remain. Uh, at that stage there would be mass terms and uh, damping terms and stiffness terms. These are pretty close to physical degrees of freedom at this point with some agglomeration effects into the reduced matrices at this level, but closer to a physical set of degrees of freedom. But now we want to make a strong uh, distinction between the original uh, physical degrees of freedom and then a reduced analysis set by doing this kind of partitioning, where we partition the, these free degrees of freedom into the analysis and the omitted set. 
Now, I'm going to do um, poetic license here, or author's license, to uh, assume that those were numbered in a way such that I can consecutively partition out these omitted ones. Now, normally the analysis set ought to be less in the ratio of 1 to 10, let's say. You'd like to reduce your degrees of freedom greatly by doing this method. So um, I don't mean that these two vector uh, subcomponents here are of the same size. One of them, uh, the omitted set, is generally way bigger than the other. Now, what we're going to assume is that the relation between the analysis and the omitted variables is based on static equilibrium concepts. That makes this sort of a first order correction for uh, dynamic condensation. And other people will come along later and say, hey, I can improve this by 5, 10% by uh, accounting for those degrees of freedom that are omitted in a dynamic way. But we don't do this. You need to walk before you can run in this case. So you actually do a mental experiment really starting here. And I'll draw an arrow here for a short time, and then I'll tell you when we stop doing this. We drop out the inertia and damping forces and look at an, a static problem, which means that you're looking at your dynamic problem in a quasi-static way, as if dynamics really didn't matter. And all of the degrees of freedom are related purely by the springs that connect them, the elastic forces. Let's carry out a mental experiment now to help us eliminate the unwanted degrees of freedom in this problem. One way to do it is imagine a simplified structure such as this beam-like structure shown here and identify certain important degrees of freedom such as these analysis degrees of freedom at the right end, the center, and the left end and then identify less important degrees of freedom, such as these at the intermediate uh, spots there and there. Uh, then the analysis nodes are to be treated as master nodes that control the whole system. This reminds me of the lofting curves that were used uh, when I worked uh, years ago at Vought Aircraft and at Boeing, where they had long plastic strips and then these strips were held in place at intervals by what they called ducts. And these were heavy lead bodies that had uh, a nose on them, and they looked a little bit like a duck. Uh, that's where the name came from, uh, that fit into the uh, slot along the top edge of this plastic strip. And then by controlling the shape of that long strip at intervals, the draftsman had a nice smooth contour to follow uh, with their pen. And this is very much the same philosophy that we have here. We want the analysis degrees of freedom to control all of the shape of the body statically. When we write out the equations, uh, presuming that the analysis degrees of freedom are above the partitioning marks here and the omitted degrees of freedom are below, then we have this set of equations. For this mental experiment only, we don't put live loads on the omitted degrees of freedom. Many students who study this forget later on and think that you can't have live loads on the full structure's uh, omitted degrees of freedom. That's not true. Now these are the physical degrees of freedom uh, presently, and these are physical forces on the analysis degrees of freedom up above. You're able to partition out and solve the second large set of uh, equations here. Uh, which involve these coefficients shown below. The KOA matrix, which is rectangular. The KOO matrix, which is square. Then by inverting the KOO matrix, you can solve for the omitted degrees of freedom in terms of the analysis degrees of freedom. So this is a mapping that you might want to consider moving in this direction and uh, very effective then at letting these analysis degrees of freedom control the omitted degrees of freedom. We'll give that mapping matrix a symbol G, and here it is. And we will include the minus sign within that definition shown here. 
I suppose G can, uh, as a crutch, can uh, be thought of as a Guyan uh, transformation here. So then you have the ability to take the smaller set of variables u sub a and let it drive the larger set u sub f over here. Um, interestingly, to expand this set in the static way we've had uh, just described, then you use the identity matrix here to map into the smaller set, say of, of uh, relative size one, and then you use the GOA matrix to give you the omitted coordinates here. So it's as if there's two parallel pipelines here going from right to left. The analysis degrees of freedom propagate straight through this system into the free degrees of freedom. And the omitted ones have to be mapped to become uh, their rightful spot in the free degrees of freedom. All right. So we've got a mapping. We've got a way to statically condense this problem. At this point, we have ended the mental experiment, which was up above. And now we get back to the real world. We look at the full equation of motion for our free degrees of freedom. And we replace the free degrees of freedom with the equivalent mapping version. Now, if we want to take a single derivative of this, that works. You can take a second derivative, that works. So I can map the not only the displacement field, but the velocity field and the acceleration field with the same mapping. That's because all of these quantities in here are, are not time dependent. That was from our static experiment, a static curve. And then on the right, we will um, also consider that the original forces on the system here um, were, and these are close to physical forces here, are an F bar of A and an F zero. I carry the bar temporarily to, uh, to avoid the use of the F sub A, which I'll have later on. So I'm reserving the unbarred uh, symbol F for later final use. All right, we are in the same position as we've been earlier in this lecture series where we have, say, n equations in m unknowns. And we need to do something to convert this into a better handled set of equations. And again, we look toward an energy approach where we can pre-multiply by something that's displacement-like. This particular set of equations here would, in a plate structure, have alternate translations and rotations. And it's numerically uh, not real well posed at this time. And uh, uh, so we'll move to the next figure to show the uh, Galerkin type approach. Our set of equations, then, is a set of force and moment balances at this point. But if we do a pre-multiplication with a displacement-like uh, vector, then we're going to end up with an energy balance instead. So we pre-multiply by our same transformation matrix. And that gives us this set of quantities. And we get a new kind of mass here out of this triple matrix product. And we'll call these the uh, analysis mass terms. Here we get a new kind of damping matrix that we'll call the analysis or reduced uh, damping terms. And here's a new kind of stiffness shown here. On the force side, we get a new set of equivalent loads. These are A set loads. These are uh, have become more and more artificial. They're not the original physical set of loads on A, but they're, they're the representation of all the loads in the system and how you have to agglomerate those at the remaining few degrees of freedom. So these are basically equivalent forces over here. In the earlier terminology where we had dealt with uh, modal degrees of freedom and generalized uh, degrees of freedom, we got generalized forces. And this is definitely that same uh, philosophy. You might think of these as reduced degrees of freedom and reduced forces.
the theory for gland reduction is really rather nice and um, can be incorporated into computer codes rather straightforwardly. There's uh, a few decisions to be made. Uh, I'll show how those have been resolved in the uh, user implementation in MSC NASTRAN. Here you have a body that is a potato shape and has live loads in various places on the body. Some on uh, what are too soon to be analysis degrees of freedom and some on what will be omitted degrees of freedom. How should you model such a system as this? Well, for one thing, you should take any point or any area here that has a large mass and make sure it has analysis degrees of freedom describing it. That way you're not using the uh, so-called beaming out of the mass effects there to some other node point. So it reduces the effect of the static reduction. You should distribute the A points over the body somewhat uniformly so that you're doing a fair job of representing the, the total geometry. That also means that you don't have to beam out the inertia effects so far and the damping effects. Now these two are rather common sense. The third one is not so intuitive and that's a feeling that it's better for the A set to have both the translational and rotational set of degrees of freedom. And that means you're going to uh, do this breaking down of degrees of freedom into analysis and omitted degrees of freedom node by node. That's not obvious. I did a, uh, a problem years ago with a, a woman professor from China, Mrs. Zhu, and we decided at that time to include only translational degrees of freedom in the analysis set. The rationale was okay there because it was a civil engineering structure and it was going to be easier to measure translational accelerations uh, at points and not have transducers that measured rotational effects. I think by now there are probably good transducers for both, but it was somewhat experimentally motivated to not do this uh, third user friendly action. As a result of this third one, though, it's relatively easy to set up runs in MSC NASTRAN because you only need to mention the analysis nodes and then proceed. Notice that you'd rather call out the analysis nodes than the omitted nodes because they are perhaps 10 or 100 times as numerous. So that's the convention in typical problems uh, run on MSC NASTRAN. My teaching style in the past has typically been to try to break down a larger finite element process into a simple hand calculation aside from the use of the computer. Uh, this helps develop intuition and it can be done uh, luckily for Guyane reduction here. A physical problem that I will take is going to be trivial then because it's a simple beam element and a single one undergoing small amplitude vibration in the XY plane. The idea is to find the fundamental flexural frequency in the XY plane, ignoring the axial, torsional, and out-of-plane vibrations. Again, we're going to have a compact cross-section, say a re rectangular cross-section. So uh, if these are principal um, coordinate directions uh, for principal axes of inertia, then the problem uncouples nicely and we can just study flexural vibration in the XY plane. Physical modeling is to use the conventional Euler-Bernoulli beam theory so that plane sections remain plane. And we constrain those um, out of plane motions and the axial and torsional motions. Boundary conditions at the root are that there are no rotations nor translations there. At the free tip, you find that you have no uh, moment and no shear. In the finite element modeling, I'm going to first take the most odious comparison that I can uh, by constraining the tip translation to be the omitted degree of freedom and then using the tip rotation to be the uh, analysis degree of freedom. Now, 
that means that we um, are trying to make the rotation at the tip control the entire dynamics of the problem. Furthermore, if I use the lumped mass approach, that means I'm concentrating all the mass at the tip as a point mass, and there's no rotatory inertia involved. Somehow, this condensation method has got to account for that and convert that translational inertia effect into something governed by the rotational degree of freedom. So that's really not easy. Now, it will turn out that this works, although we have some 20% error in this case. So uh, when I pushed the problem this hard, I thought maybe I won't get answers that make any sense at all. Here's the uh, degrees of freedom that are shown. Uh, of course, we're constraining the tip with these degrees of freedom. Uh, so the only uh, free degrees of freedom are those two here. And um, I'm going to make the U3 be the omitted degree of freedom, uh, and in other words, a slave to the U4 degree of freedom. So this is the toughest case possible, particularly when shown below that I have a point mass out at the tip when I use the lumped mass matrix. Remember that it moves half the mass to the tip and half to the root. Well, the root mass is uh, disabled and doesn't even move then. By moving half the mass to the tip, we're somewhat overemphasizing the inertia effect by moving it outboard. But then we're requiring that that be governed by the static motion of the, the rotation of the tip. So right off the bat, you might say you've lost the entire inertial effect, but you haven't. Because in the static relation that Guyane has developed, if there is a tip rotation, there will have to be correspondingly a static tip deflection. And that was the whole idea of that approach. Um, now, dynamically, they may not be related, but statically, as soon as I give a positive angle here, this beam will naturally go upward. So the inertial effect is properly accounted for. Now let's go to the solution. We'll gather the equations of motion for all of those original degrees of freedom. This would be called the G set of degrees of freedom because we are just now applying the single point constraints at the wall. Those cause these first two degrees of freedom to be zero. When we partition those out, then we really are going from the G set now down to what we've called the F set of degrees of freedom. We haven't yet done the condensation. We're left with these reduced um, matrices here, which are still physical terms as they stand. Now we want to do the condensation approach. Our lumped mass matrix effectively moves half of the translational mass out to the free tip and half of it to the root, where it's constrained anyway. Here's the uh, mass matrix reduced to the free coordinates. And here you see the tip mass of one half the total beam mass. Stiffness comes from the Euler-Bernoulli theory, uh, simple beam theory. We now do our mental experiment, which is a static problem. So right here, we draw a line and say we're going to do this mental experiment. We don't allow forces on the omitted degree of freedom, which is translational, but we do allow a moment here on the, um, on the analysis degree of freedom. Then we use the first equation in this case to solve for the translation in terms of the tip rotation. Uh, because the beam moves from zero slope at the root to a, a tip rotation out here, you might say that this makes sense because uh, the tip deflection is taken to be the L over 2 times the tip rotation. And if the average rotation over the length of the beam is half of the tip rotation, which would be approximate, then you're getting a displacement by measuring an angle through a, a distance. So it's pretty close to the normal definition of uh, arc lengths and so on. So you can get some physical feeling for this expression, so it's not completely stupid.
Now let's form our coordinate transformation. And the uh, analysis degree of freedom U4, which is a rotation, maps directly into U4, which shouldn't surprise us. And then it also creates the uh, translation here by this factor L over 2. Now, that's the end of our mental experiment. And now we progress to the real problem again. The real problem that we're interested in is not forced motion, but finding the uh, natural frequency of this system, the uh, lowest natural frequency. So we put zeros on the right-hand side. There are no live loads. Then we've got our various uh, matrices here, and we've got our transformed variable here. So we're down to the analysis set. We pre-multiply by the transpose of that uh, uh, coordinate transformation here to put this on more of an energy basis. So we collect terms and simplify them and get the resulting differential equation for free vibration. Here's the equation, and you have a uh, generalized mass term and a generalized stiffness term. Now, from here down to the actual answer, it's just a matter of putting in the harmonic motion, realizing that derivatives bring out minus omega squared, collect terms. You have all of these terms that multiply a uh, term here, which is an amplitude term. Solve for the uh, unusual situation where you can have an arbitrary amplitude, and it occurs when this coefficient here is zero. So you can have equilibrium with any amplitude at this specific frequency. Sometimes you might plot a curve of frequency over here versus this amplitude U4 here, and you find that there's a point in along here at a certain frequency, and that's what we've just found, which is a so-called natural frequency. Here is the resulting number. And when you compare this with the classical solution, which has a constant out front of 3.52 rather than this 2.82, uh, you find our solution is low by 20%. At first, you say, wait a minute, you're never supposed to be low on these approximate solutions if you're truly within the uh, Rayleigh-Ritz or the potential energy format. But in this case, our lumped mass approximation is a non-physical approximation. And it has moved so much mass out to the tip that it has lowered the frequency in this way. And, and so it is explainable. Generalized dynamic reduction was developed by Richard McNeil some years ago, and it's been very powerful, used by a lot of uh, uh, vehicle companies for studying large problems. It's a combination of two methods of a uh, Guyan type reduction with a modal analysis. So it's both a modal and a nodal reduction. It brings in some coordinates here that are generalized coordinates, UQ. And the analysis set is broken into some generalized and some physical coordinates. At the very end, the generalized coordinates become the master one. Let's break down those uh, F set of variables, which I've been calling a free set. And uh, assuming that prior to that, you've already taken out uh, multipoint constraints and single point constraints. So here's your total. F set on the left, and on the right here we have the uh, omitted degrees of freedom as before with the Guyan approach, and then we have the generalized coordinates, those that are used for rigid body mode description, uh, and then some free coordinates here and some rigidly restrained coordinates. Some of these are a new concept now. Uh, I won't go into details on that. Uh, it's a generalized coordinate that is a surviving set, though. So those generalized coordinates are the ones that drive the whole problem. Here's the kind of mapping that's developed and uh, progresses from these coordinates on back to these uh, U sub F coordinates over here.
there are some approximate modes involved here and uh, this is related uh, in a sense to the super element approach where you divide a structure into these segments. This is really an advanced topic and the mappings are intricate and uh, I have to admit failure. I wanted to show a simple hand calculation for this method and I could not do it. There's just too many variables involved and it's if you have to start out with six, five or six degrees of freedom, by the time you do the mappings to bring it down to the uh, final solution, it's just too complicated for a simple hand calculation. But uh, many people like this implementation in Nastran and have gotten used to it for uh, vehicle uh, dynamics. Another reduction method that's popular with some people is the component mode synthesis. Um, this competes nowadays with the Lanchos method and it's useful for very large problems. It's a super element concept. It's the dynamic version of super elements or substructuring. And you use those vibration modes of the super elements to infer what the properties of the entire system are. Um, there are at least two versions of this kind of approach and one is where at the joints between the uh, super elements you uh, develop the individual element or the super element properties with fixed boundaries and the other method is where you have free boundaries and this is a, an advanced topic. Um, some people prefer the fixed boundaries, um, even though experimentalists prefer the free boundaries. This may be another one of these areas where, depending on the problem you're doing, you would like to use one approach or the other. Our problem session will concentrate on the Guyane reduction. Um, it's one that we can actually do some hand calculations with. The first problem I take is a uh, two element line assembly which is vibrating along its axis and the idea is to determine the frequency response of this system using this static condensation. I'm going to ask two things. I don't want the whole problem solved but just to find the mapping matrix for the coordinates for either choice of analysis degrees of freedom, namely the motion at the midpoint here or at the right end. And then to explain which of those analysis degrees of freedom is the better one to choose as the analysis uh, degree of freedom and therefore the controlling the whole problem. I'll replace the symbols EA over L which are used for stiffness of a line element by a single symbol, a lowercase k. So we have a stiffness of the left and the right elements characterized by these symbols. So they fit into the assembly of the stiffness matrix. For mass, I'll use a lower and an uppercase m. And then here I've applied the fixed boundary condition at the left, which gives me the zeros in those two locations. I'm showing what is the true forced response problem which has no force at the center node and a reaction at the left node and a live load at the right. But now wait, we must do a mental experiment and that is different from the original problem. First you knock out the inertia terms and then you conceive of a problem where you only have loads on the analysis degree of freedom. So we're going to first keep uh, the uh, center node as the analysis node. Therefore, in our mental experiment, we only have a load F2. That means we can solve the second equation here, which gives that the outboard displacement is the same as the inboard. And if you think about that, yeah, that makes sense. Statically, for very slow motion, if I stretch this inboard link here and to this point, then the outboard one, if there's only static forces, will just go along for the ride and just moves as a rigid body. 
Let's do that same mental experiment and find the coordinate transformation if you use the tip coordinate as the analysis or master degree of freedom. And here's this mental experiment with the load now put on uh, the tip degree of freedom. In this case, you would use the first equation to relate the two variables. And this becomes the needed mapping. So now if I compare them side by side, and this was the question, the first question, what are the mappings? Here's the mapping for U2 as the master node, and here's the mapping when U3 is the master. So the question is, which one is the better choice? That's our uh, point here under B. Well, it's really better to choose the outboard degree of freedom, U3, because it brings in the flexibility of that outboard element. Otherwise, it would be just a rigid body mass moving and would probably give you a lower frequency, I would guess. So uh, there's a bit of a conflict in that you're then putting the um, analysis degree of freedom out on a lighter weight or a less mass less massive part of the structure, but in this case you would need to do that in order to get the elasticity of the entire system brought into play. Let's return to that question of the single beam element where we used static condensation to reduce the problem to a single degree of freedom problem we were looking for free vibration of the uh, beam element, and it's a cantilevered beam configuration. This time, I'm going to start off um, as a separate permutation of what I consider the best of all worlds, that is to use the consistent mass matrix and then to use the tip deflection for the analysis degree of freedom rather than the tip rotation. So this should be the most accurate solution. Uh, when this is done, you can uh, assemble the full set of equations first. The mental experiment that we do starting here uh, allows a live load at the tip in the translational degree of freedom and then no rotational force. And the static equilibrium law allows us to solve for U4 in terms of U3. And here is that relation. We see here that the uh, tip translation will give us a tip rotation according to the static law. Uh, the average angle between the tip and the base is uh, U3 over L in radians. The tip deflection here is shown to be 3 halves steeper than that. And this should be an accurate static solution. This becomes the transformation, the G matrix here. And again, we get the tip deflection mapping directly to the tip deflection, the tip deflection giving us the tip rotation through that path. We go back into the full equation for free vibration, calculate these um, reduced masses and stiffnesses, and we'll get the um, one by one problem in the next slide. We'll assume harmonic motion and gather the terms. And again, we get a mechanical impedance term here and the displacement, the single component. We solve for that and we get frequency to be a generalized mass or a reduced mass uh, and a reduced stiffness term. The uh, reduced mass here is given, the reduced stiffness. You do the multiplications and it comes out with this result where this constant now is only 0.14 percent higher than the classical value. So this particular version of uh, Guyan reduction um, where we use the, um, the best modeling techniques came out to be very accurate kind of a nice result.
There are four permutations that are possible in this beam problem. Um, those that use consistent mass, those that use lumped mass, um, those versions that use the tip rotation as the analysis degree of freedom, and those that use tip translation as the analysis degree of freedom. Now we've done two of those four cases. Uh, in fact, we've done the worst modeling procedure and the best modeling procedure. I'd like to fill out the uh, permutation of possible problems by doing the other two, and we'll move th through those pretty quickly. If we keep the consistent mass idea and then switch to rotation as a master coordinate, as we did in our first go around in the lecture, uh, we just change the mass term involved, uh, put that into the frequency expression, and we find now that we get an answer that is high. Um, this seems to make more sense in the Rayleigh tradition because we're constraining the kind of motion here by uh, our static law and probably won't get the lowest energy solution. So normally you would get a high answer. And this is a, um, a much higher than the classical natural frequency. The fourth permutation is to use lumped mass and then tip translation. And this is somewhere intermediate in modeling uh, style. Not so good because of the lumped mass. Uh, we change back to the mass component. We use the mapping for the tip translation, put that into our previous frequency expression, and this time we find we're quite low. So uh, again, the moving outboard of the uh, mass has caused us some trouble, and, and it's a modeling error by doing that. Um, translation, however, is a decent uh, tip uh, uh, degree of freedom to use. Let me summarize the results of our four permutations of that simple beam vibration problem using uh, static condensation. Here I have uh, the most accurate at the top with consistent mass and U3 as the master. And that's right on. Now if you use the awkward uh, master coordinate, then you've badly constrained the system in the static uh, displacement sense and you get a much higher answer than you should. If you make the modeling uh, approximation of the lumped mass, that's definitely going to move mass out to the tip and slow the system down. When you uh, do the, uh, the better of the analysis degrees of freedom, you have minus 29% here. This is interesting. This is really below the classical value. And lastly, the worst. Uh, Really, the worst modeling of all is to use lump mass and then the awkward master coordinate. But you see, it's not the worst answer. And the reason is there's a partial cancellation of effects. The lump mass tends to lower the frequency because it's a uh, awkward mass distribution. But on the other hand, this constraint of the poor choice of analysis coordinate tends to raise the natural frequency, and so giving somewhat of a cancellation of effects there. So uh, that's interesting. Really, the poorest of the modeling procedures had some compensation of error and was not the poorest final result. Problem three is an example that shows how the force reduction process occurs in a forced vibration problem where static condensation is used. Let's take a simple beam problem again, vibrating in the xy plane, and it's under the action of vertical uh, tip force and a uh, tip moment as shown. We're going to use Gaian reduction and remove the tip rotation as an omitted degree of freedom, so we only have tip translation as our analysis variable. The physical equation of motion looks as shown here. This would be the F set in Nastran terminology. 
and has already had the single point constraints applied that remove those to uh, other degrees of freedom. As before with static condensation, we'll carry out a mental experiment where there are no loads in the rotational tip degree of freedom, and we write down the static law that results. This gives us a coordinate transformation where the rotation is one-seventh of the translation, and then the mapping to the reduced form re reduces that uh, previously a two-vector into a one-vector characterized by the component F3 now, which is the final reduced force on the F3 uh, coordinate to be 3.714. So this is a single combined external force in translation that is supposed to have the same effect as both the original physical force and moment did. And that's certainly not intuitive that you could do that, but that is a statically equivalent representation. So it's clear that when you do this modeling, there's um, quite a bit going on in the background. It's rather easy to use static condensation within MSC, NASTRAN, and other codes. So the user should be aware of what's going on internally. And I guess that's the purpose of such a course as this.